Thank you very much. Um, I, I first have to say that the, the marmot metaphor springs from real life, from an incident when my boys and I were, were hiking up uh, to Wheeler Peak in northern New Mexico and uh, camped out to have lunch and indeed encountered a male marmot who <laughs> uh, resented our presence. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew, for that excessively kind introduction. And uh, uh, thanks to both Brian and Andrew and the other McLaren CSF staff for, for bringing me here and, and uh, hosting me so hospitably. Um, I uh, uh, want tonight to uh, first give a quick overview of a historical development that as uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, I have written about in the past, a development that is highly relevant to McLaren CSF in its role in trying to bridge the gap between the university and the church, and that is the secularization of higher education. Um, but that very quick historical overview uh, is preface to some musings at greater length about the situation that secularization creates for Christians and indeed for most people of religious faith uh, in the academy today. Um, it's a pretty well-known fact that the church gave birth to the university. Um, now, in fact, that fact may be a little too well known because probably the earliest European university, Bologna, arose independently of ecclesiastical uh, authority and was often at odds with the church. Nonetheless, it was generally true that Christian churches nurtured, protected, and uh, tried to control universities through the first several centuries of their existence. Now, at first, this meant universities uh, uh, that lived in synergy and intention with the medieval Catholic Church, typically represented by the local bishop. Uh, after the Reformation, of course, the different established churches, uh, Lutheran, Reformed, or Catholic, dominated the universities in their respective countries. The exact character of the relationship between church and university differed from place to place. Um, until the 19th century, for example, England had only two universities, Oxford and Cambridge. Both were Anglican institutions, uh, staffed almost entirely by Anglican clergy, and awarding degrees only to students who swore allegiance to Anglican doctrine. Uh, in Scotland, in contrast, late, there were more universities, lay teachers became more common in them, and universities inquired less closely into their students' beliefs. But even there, neither students nor faculty could openly stray far from the Presbyterian Westminster Confession. Uh, some variant of this situation uh, prevailed throughout Europe and in its American colonies when those appeared. In the new United States, the abolition of legally established churches and the competition of multiple denominations created a distinctive framework for higher education. Many colleges and universities were founded by churches and largely staffed by ministers. But the need to attract enough students to stay afloat, not, not a need unknown even today in colleges and universities, um, prevented colleges, except for Catholic colleges, from teaching in denominationally specific ways. Non-Catholic colleges instead bathe themselves in a kind of generic, evangelically tinged uh, Protestantism. This non-sectarian uh, Protestantism, as it was often called, reflected the dominant sentiments of the American middle and upper classes. 
the kind of people who paid for colleges and universities and were most likely to send their kids there. Indeed, so dominant was the outlook that state universities acquired the same vaguely evangelical Protestant character. Um, when it opened in the 1840s, for example, the University of Michigan uh, appointed Protestant ministers to most of its professorships, and they doled the jobs out uh, equitably to each of the major Protestant denominations in, uh, in Michigan. Uh, so, you know, the Methodists got a professor, the Baptists got a professor, the Presbyterians got a professor. Um, the university required students to attend uh, church on Sundays at a church of their choice, as well as daily chapel, um, and it held its commencement exercises in the local Presbyterian church. This is, all of this doesn't fit with what we would now think of as the separation of church and state in, in public higher education. The Baptists, as it happens, were awarded the first philosophy professor, and he promptly converted six of his students and marched them down to the Huron River to immerse them. Um, now, Minnesota, a couple decades later, uh, when its real university level education started, wouldn't have been much different. Uh, in Europe, starting in the late 18th century, the ties between church and universities began to fray. Sometimes this happened dramatically, as when the French Revolution suppressed all university faculties in 1793, all of them more or less Catholic. Sometimes it occurred gradually and almost underground, uh, as with a slow drift away from religious commitments by universities and university professors in German-speaking Europe. So by the late 19th century, universities almost everywhere in Western Europe stood independent of churches. The separation of churches from colleges and universities started later in America, but proceeded rapidly. It began about a century and a half ago uh, then American colleges and universities began to shuck off the Protestant identity with which almost all of them were born. Then too, modern academic disciplines began to form, which reinforced the process and probably speeded it up. Uh, modern disciplines, unlike earlier academic study, uh, conceived of knowledge as divided into distinct compartments with labels like uh, economics, chemistry, sociology, history, and so forth. Each discipline had its own methods and subject matter, loosely connected, if at all, with knowledge in other disciplines. Um, discipline formation, thus, denied in practice uh, that Christian beliefs or those of any other religion were relevant to research in any discipline. Uh, they're separate categories, separate compartments, uh, leaving aside theology, of course, or to some extent the new discipline of religious studies. Together, all of these developments that uh, created a gap between the university and the churches uh, have come to be known to historians of higher education as the secularization of the university, largely complete by the 1920s. So far, the story I've told is in no way controversial. Any competent historian of higher education would agree with the broad picture, even if maybe highlighting different parts of it. But now I'm going to abandon my role as a neutral historian 
and start to make some value judgments. Secularization on the whole was, I think, a very good thing. Ask any Jew or Catholic who teaches at the University of Minnesota today. Probably neither could have done so when the university was founded. Ask any evolutionary biologist who doesn't worry about getting fired because she teaches evolution. Um, and she too will think secularization a very good thing. But secularization also had drawbacks. And I want to focus on one of them. My own experience shapes my comments this evening. So let me begin uh, in a self-centered way by describing briefly my path into academic life. I start in this personal way because it really isn't idiosyncratic. Most university teachers who are Christians in the United States share a vocational dilemma roughly similar to the one I'm about to describe. Many details, of course, will differ. In my case, I was raised Roman Catholic. As a boy, I attended a Jesuit high school. From the Jesuits' point of view, it was a feeble institution on the frontiers of civilized society because it didn't teach Greek. Um, but I, there I, I learned mathematics and Latin and history and so forth. I also got a solid introduction to a Catholic philosophic tradition of great importance at that time, neo-scholasticism or neo-Thomism, uh, and to Catholic doctrine more generally as that was taught in the early 1960s. My Jesuit teachers encouraged me to go to Harvard for college rather than to a Catholic university. And I stayed at Harvard through doctoral studies. After receiving a PhD in 1975, I taught for 20 years at three state universities before moving to Notre Dame in 1995. Now, how did this experience enable me to work as a Christian historian? The answer is simple. It didn't. In teaching history and in writing history, I can draw on something like two centuries of modern historical scholarship. We historians have at hand highly developed methods for evaluating and interpreting evidence. Uh, we share a complex understanding of historical analysis, analysis and narrative and how to do the analysis and how to write the narrative. And there are more books relevant to the subjects that I write about than I could possibly read. But my Christian formation gives me no intellectual help, and I want to undermine the word intellectual, in my work as a historian. Christianity does provide a moral compass, which you know, guides me, even though I often stray off course. Um, for example, Christianity instructs me and the rest of us to treat other human beings with loving respect for their individual dignity and needs. Though, of course, Christianity has no monopoly on the golden rule. Um, so as a historian, specifically, uh, Christianity obliges me to treat with charity uh, those graduate students who are struggling to complete a dissertation, but also the dead persons I write about. Um, I need to treat them all as individual human beings worthy of respect and dignity in their own right. Um, but the work of a historian, like that of any other scholar or scientist, is not primarily moral. 
but rather intellectual in nature. And in the intellectual realm, Christianity offers essentially no help to a historian like me. I have really two different vocations, one religious, one secular. One is the vocation to live as a Christian. The other is, to borrow a phrase from the great German sociologist Max Weber, scholarship as a vocation. And in the academic world today, no intellectual link joins Christian faith and learned research and teaching. As Weber wrote, science or scholarship, quote, today is irreligious. Science or scholarship free from presuppositions in the sense of a rejection of religious bonds does not know of truths of faith. Quote, if it did, science would be unfaithful to its own presuppositions, unquote. Weber described accurately American universities such as the University of Minnesota. No links exist between any religious faith and the substantive contents of any academic discipline, uh, except, again, for disciplines that take religion as their subject matter, such as religious studies. And as I learned when I moved to Notre Dame in 1995, Catholic universities are just like other universities in this respect. They have to be if they want to be academically respected. For academic disciplines, it's the way we organize knowledge today, with the small exceptions just mentioned, do not recognize Christianity or any other religious tradition as a legitimate source of intellectual insight. Christians can certainly be both good Christians and good scholars, but only so long as they keep the two vocations intellectually separate. Educated Christians today, at least in America and Western Europe, thus live with divided minds. They hold one set of beliefs about reality stemming from Christian faith. In this view, the world was created by God and expresses God's loving providence. But these beliefs are, so to speak, our Sunday knowledge. But they hold another set of beliefs about reality, taught in colleges and universities, in which God does not play a role. And this secular learning provides knowledge for most everyday purposes whether as business people, uh, doctors, lawyers, or scholars. Now, I doubt anyone in this room would want Baptist physics or Methodist astronomy. But it's not so clear that Christianity ought to fall mute when scholarship involves human society and culture. To put this dilemma in different words, our most fundamental understanding of the world as Christians does not fit with most of the details we know about the world as educated people. Our theological knowledge has nothing to do with our knowledge of sociology, management, law, medicine, etc. This situation is relatively recent at least as we historians measure time. The divorce of knowledge from Christianity in European universities only started to become clear in the second half of the 18th century in German universities, and really only in retrospect, I think. Most British and American universities remained intellectually Christian until the late 19th century. And American Catholic universities did not entirely accept the secular quality of academic knowledge until the 1960s. The separation of knowledge 
from religion then is not eternal, it's not inevitable, there's no reason in principle why Christianity can't exert an intellectual influence on knowledge. But in fact, Christians do now live in a world on which faith has little or no intellectual grip. And we will continue to live in, to live in that world as far as we can see into the future. This situation prevents Christian scholars and teachers, even those who work in officially Christian institutions, from carrying out fully their vocation of education and formation. They can now give only a relatively narrow formation to the next generation of Christian leaders. They can educate morally in a Christian way. They can educate theologically in one or another Christian tradition, but they cannot educate across the broad range of intellectual disciplines in an intellectually Christian way. Now they could, of course, solve this problem. They could retreat into exclusively Christian institutions that resurrect a mode of knowledge dominant uh, in the United States 150 years ago. There, they could cut ties with the larger world of research and try to create biblically or theologically grounded versions of the various academic disciplines. A few very conservative uh, Protestant institutions have tried this path uh, at least halfway. I think of a place like Bob Jones University, for example. Uh, this option would reconnect faith with knowledge, but at a high cost. The Christian churches would give up any chance of influencing the largely secular culture in which they live. And students would go out into the world intellectually crippled, uh, unable to think effectively outside of a Christian ghetto. Or more likely, they would shuck off their archaic education in favor of dealing with the secular world as it actually is. Most Christian colleges and universities have therefore chosen instead to educate students and carry out research on the terms given by the secular world of knowledge that surrounds them. They thus avoid isolation and prepare students for the world that actually exists. But this practical compromise, too, carries a high cost. With no way to link Christian intellectual traditions to secular thought, the churches have little influence on the culture around them. And students go out into the world crippled in a different way, unable to integrate their Christian faith into their understanding of the natural world and human societies. The problem is basic. Most academics believe that religion should not affect the intellectual contents of teaching and research, again, except of course where religion is the subject of study. In most fields, religion is supposed to be a private matter. You might have a passion for Big Ten basketball, uh, but that should have no connection, no influence on the substantive content of your teaching or research. Likewise, you may profess Christian faith, but just as tomorrow night's game should play no role in your research and teaching, uh, so your faith should not influence the substantive content of your teaching or research. Not only scholars without religious beliefs think like this, so do most Christian scholars. This is the way of the academic world today. As a result, Christian intellectual traditions have lost most of their significance. Self-consciously Christian thinking tends now to limit itself to two jobs. One, deepening understanding of the Christian faith itself. Two, providing guidance on moral questions. 
Those are crucial tasks, make no mistake, but they're not the whole vocation of Christian scholars and teachers. Many professors do approach their work in a self-consciously Christian way. In the United States, at least, they've seemed to be growing in number or at least coming out of the closet. A few of them, and I think, for example, of my Notre Dame colleagues, the historian Mark Knoll and the sociologist Chris Smith, have attained great distinction in their fields. Their faith is important to them personally. Their faith may aid them in the moral formation of their subjects. It certainly aids them in their own uh, moral understanding of the work they're doing. It may even influence the subjects they choose to study. Both Knoll and Smith, for example, to stick with those examples, graduated from Christian colleges, uh, Wheaton and Gordon College, uh, respectively. Both are theologically learned. Both focus their research on religion. It's history in the case of Nall, it's sociology in the case of Chris Smith. But Christianity rarely gives even such self-consciously Christian scholars intellectual resources as they pursue their vocations as historians, sociologists, or you know, professors of management or law, economists or anthropologists. In their methods and in their canons of evidence and argument, Nolan Smith look like any other first-rate historian or first-rate sociologist. Um, Noll's most recent book, for example, is a magisterial study of the Bible in American public life during the centuries between first European settlement of North America and, and American independence. In his introductory, introductory comments to the book, Noel's Christian commitments are clear, and occasionally they crop up later in the text. But I can see nothing identifiably Christian in the writing of the history itself. That is, any highly gifted historian, and there aren't very many as highly gifted as Mark Noel, but any highly gifted historian might have written the book. Even an atheist, uh, unusually sympathetic, to religion. Yet if Christian beliefs do not in some way connect with a Christian university teacher's academic discipline, then that teacher cannot fully live out his or her vocation. Higher education has a moral dimension, but it is fundamentally intellectual in nature. If the Christian faith remains silent in almost all academic disciplines, then universities, even Christian universities, cannot form well future Christian leaders. By the early 1990s, this division of my vocation into a Christian half and a historian half, if you will, began to irritate me. In looking back on my writings, I thought I could see ways in which my Jesuit education and even my teenage exposure to neo-scholasticism had shaped my work as a historian more or less subliminally. I began to think it possible that Christianity might speak again across a broad range of humanistic and social scientific knowledge. And I grew more and more convinced that such an intellectual revival is essential if Christians working in colleges and universities are fully to live out their vocations. Although it may at first seem odd to say so, the place to start is not in the classroom, but rather in research. Because what teachers teach in the classroom ultimately comes from research. All the good intentions in the world 
will not empower a teacher of management or political science to show students how Christianity connects with their study unless the textbook is open to such connections. And textbooks simply synthesize generations of research by scholars. So in 1997, I did what academics do in this bureaucratic age. I raised some money from foundations and I started a research center. Um, this outfit at Notre Dame was called the Erasmus Institute, as Andrew briefly mentioned. The Erasmus Institute aimed to support religiously grounded research of a particular kind, research that brought Christian intellectual traditions into the academic mainstream. Now, what could that mean in this day and age? Well, an example is research that might take ideas put forward by St. Augustine or other fathers of the church that were relevant to linguists, psychologists, or political theorists. Um, and there were, in fact, examples of research done by scholars resident at the Erasmus Institute in all three of those areas. Um, it doesn't matter whether the scholars themselves were believers or unbelievers. If they're doing that kind of work, they're reconnecting Christian intellectual traditions with uh, uh, academic disciplines that, as they exist today. The Erasmus Institute's uh, seminars, conferences, and residential fellowships um, at various universities around the U.S. and indeed in Europe and uh, Latin America, attracted both distinguished senior scholars and promising younger researchers from North America, Europe, and Latin America. Most of them are Christians, but not all of them. But intellectual success doesn't pay the bills. The Erasmus Institute always existed on soft money, chiefly several millions in grants from a single foundation. When the foundation's priorities changed, Notre Dame lacked enough interest in the Erasmus Institute's goals to keep it afloat. And it finally sank in 2005. The story is typical. Only a handful of institutions are trying to rebuild intellectual links between Christianity and scholarship. Most of them are fleeting, like the Erasmus Institute. Uh, and Erasmus was unusual and perhaps even unique in being well-funded while it lasted and able to reach outside its own university. Nor, like Notre Dame, are Christian universities rushing to fund such institutions. So I hope you appreciate McLaren CSF and remember it in your wills. <laughs> um, no problem, I've come to think, more deeply affects the work of Christians in academe than the gap that opened in the 19th century between Christianity and the substantive contents of the world of learning. If ways are not found to bridge the rift, Christian scholars will never be able to develop a genuinely Christian understanding of the world and its problems congruent with academic knowledge as it actually exists, nor to communicate it to their fellow human beings, including their students. Um, I wish I could end on a rosier conclusion, but I'm actually not optimistic that this dilemma will find a solution in the foreseeable future. Uh, but maybe to point it out is a start. Thank you. <laughs>